What's up, everybody? How's all the golf nerds, swing geeks, and chopsicle teaching pros doing out there today? I am Jason Sutton, aka The Guru, where it is my job to tease out the habits, life lessons, secrets to success for some of the top performers in the teaching business and all other fields as well. This show is designed to help all you coaches by giving you the ideas, insights, and the roadmaps that helped all of these top coaches get to the pinnacle of our industry. On this episode, I talked to my good friend, Chris George. You can find him on social media at Chris George Golf on Twitter and on Instagram. A little background on Chris. He is the director of instruction at the well-known Kings Mill Resort. He is ranked number one in the state of Virginia by Golf Digest, which is a big deal. Uh, Chris was the 2010 Middle Atlantic Section Teacher of the Year, and among Chris's other accomplishments, he was named U.S. Kids Top 50 Teacher in 2008 and was selected as uh, Golf Range Association of America Top 50 Growth of the Game Teaching Professional. I do uh, apologize in advance for some of the random background noise that we get as we recorded this show in the lobby of the Fairfield Inn. And I couldn't control the crowd and onlookers uh, as they were getting coffee and checking into the lobby. But it can't overshadow this, this awesome talk with one of my favorite people in the world and in the golf business. So let's get to this wide-ranging and very interesting conversation with my friend Chris George. Chris George, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely, Guru. Thanks for having me. Hey, my pleasure. I mean, we're here in the Fairfield Inn Suites and uh, in Williamsburg, your hometown. So, here playing uh, playing a tournament and, and watching my son play. So I thought, what an opportunity to get with one of my good friends and one of the top teachers in the country and and talk a little bit uh, about your career and about golf. So. Let's uh, let's start from the beginning. Like, tell me what kind of kid you were, and then we'll sort of go through the lineage of your career. Yeah, so I started out playing in a little nine-hole golf course. Didn't have a driving range, and my parents played. And the way I learned to play was, my dad gave me a putter, and I could go along with them up to the green. And once we got to the green, if it was a par five, my dad would put the ball on the green anywhere, and I had five putts to get it in the hole. And so that continued on. As I could do par, then I moved off the green and he gave me an eight iron. And I would chip it on and still same deal. Par five, I had to get it in five shots. Par four, four, par three, three. And so I started working my way back all the way to the 50 yard mark, 100 yard mark. I really never learned that there was anything but par. So when I was about 11 or 12, when I was on the front tee, I could shoot par. I didn't know there was stuff out there that uh, anything other than that and it was a lot of fun Um, and as I progressed playing through that I learned how to curve the ball because I really didn't hit any balls on the range I just played all the time and learned how to score and I could make the ball do what I wanted it to do and it intrigued me because I could hit the shot but I really didn't know what I was doing other than making the ball do what I wanted it to do and an Australian professional, Lloyd Braun, started teaching our junior program, and I took some lessons, and I said, I really want to know why the ball does what it does. I know I can do it, but I want to know what it do, what, what do I do to make it happen? And so he started talking about, you know, this was many years ago, and things have evolved, but he, he taught me why that happened. And once I learned that, I thought everybody needed to know that. And so that's why I was hooked on teaching and coaching just from a very young age. So how, what, what age was that when you, when you sort of started and then when you met? Yeah, I was uh, 11 or 12. Yeah. yeah, so early, right? Did Real you play early. any other sports? Were you, were you played, into anything other than golf? No, I played all kinds of sports. I played baseball, soccer, basketball. Yeah, it seems like a, a trend, I think, especially from guys that are our age. You know, we, we sort of grew up playing everything and then – sort of fell into golf or somebody introduced us to golf. So what, what kind of what kind of a child were you? Obviously you were curious because I think that's definitely a 
common trait that we're seeing from high performers like yourself, the curiosity that sort of just spur you on to learning more about the game, like you said, or you know, tell us a little bit about that. You know, it did because what happened was, you know, I love playing, I love shooting low numbers, I loved making the ball do neat things through trees, and and that curiosity for me really. Um, I'll never forget this story. My dad was in the pulp and paper industry. And uh, so science was really important. I love math. And and uh, I always would try to hit it through a tree because I had heard that trees were 90% air. Made sense, right? Right. And uh, I played a tournament and I hit a shot I shouldn't have hit. And I tried to take it up through the canopy of this tree. And he goes, when we got done, he says, that was a, a good shot. It pulled off great. But you remember, trees are 90% air, and, and I said, that's why I did it. And so we got home that night, and he, we, I was in my bedroom, and he came in, and he lifts up the window, and he takes a golf ball, and he goes, go ahead and try and toss a ball through that screen in the window. And I said, okay, what's well, not going to go through? He goes, son, that screen is 90% air, too. <laughs> <laughs> And the light bulb goes off, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like, okay, that makes sense now. I never tried to hit it through the canopy of a tree again. <laughs> the odds quite weren't, weren't, weren't what you needed, right? Yeah. That's funny. So uh, so take us through your career. Like you know, That sort of seemed like a, an ignition moment, obviously, when you, you met that gentleman that introduced you to golf a little bit and your parents. So tell us how you got – you went to, did you go to college? Yeah, I went, I went four years of college. I went to Ferrum College, played golf there, and uh, majored in recreation and leisure with uh, special populations and, and physical and mental disabilities and minoring in art. And from there, when I got out, I knew I wanted to, to get a golf job. And so I, I worked in a, in a hospital working recreation therapist and waiting out for the right one. And I ended up in Fredericksburg, Virginia at a private club and was there for five years. And as I progressed through there as an assistant, my teaching role started to get bigger and bigger and my daily operational responsibilities started to get smaller. And then I had an opportunity to come to Kings Mill, um, where I am currently, and uh, be a teaching professional. And I couldn't pass that up because I was able to move closer to home and family was there and it was it was the right thing to do to advance my career. And and uh, thankfully I've been there since then. Um, great facility, great members, um, great, just all around great uh, operation. Was there a moment uh, that you can remember that pushed you in that direction of teaching full time? Because I mean, I think, as you know, it's not for everybody. When you're an assistant, everybody might say they want to teach full time until they've, they've been thrown out there in the heat for 10 hours a day. Yeah. So was there, was there a moment that, that you can remember? You do. I would say that many of the players I was coaching, even at the private club at that point, were shooting lower scores, which was one thing, but their ball striking was better. They had command and control of the ball flight for their level, right? Um, and just the satisfaction and the joy on a player to hit a shot that they hadn't been able to hit or to, to shoot their best round ever um, was so much more exciting than me actually doing it because it was really passing it on. And I think that's what spurs it on for me is giving that opportunity to a player that who potentially thinks they don't have the ability to show them that they actually do um, have the ability to shoot low scores and enjoy the game um, and can actually score. It may be some ball striking, it might be some course management, um, it might be some mental part of the game that they need to work on to put the reality of shot making in perspective for them relative to their player level. Um, so many players today feel like they are snipers shooting a rifle, one ball through the target at the flag. And the reality of it is they're not. They're shooting a shotgun shell that has 100 BBs in it, and they don't have any perspective on where they need to aim relative to where they want the ball to finish to have the ball finish um, with the variability in the right spot. Our friend Scott Fossa would appreciate that analogy, I'm <laughs> yeah, sure, right? He would. He would. <laughs> Full credit for him. So, so you were getting results at a, at a at an early time in your career, which is which is great. I mean, how did you how did you learn to teach? Like, what were there? Did you have some mentors um, back in the day that sort of helped guide you? And then let's let's kind of get into that mentorship a little bit. Sure. The, and how you the, learned to 
What the, of your craft? The initial phase of my uh, learning my craft was um, interesting and unique. And so I mowed lawns as a kid, and I would save up my lawn mowing money, and uh, I would create a problem, a shank. I would create a low pull hook with the driver, and I would take that money, and I'd go take a 30-minute lesson from a professional and see how they fixed it. And then I would go to another professional and with the same problem and see how they fixed it. And so I did that multiple times with different issues and found out that there are several different ways to solve problems. I found out that some were much more effective than others. Um, and as a result of that, it really spawned the interest to me to learn the communication aspect of knowledge is great, but the communication to the player, how they learn, what they do, what you say, when you say it, is so important to a player's productivity during the session and then furthermore as they progress throughout the session and into a week or a month or three months down the road. So give us give us some names. What it's who who influenced you early on? I mean there's gotta be some guys. I mean we've all had you know some influences what who are some of your mentors so so many um early on and and even now ben thompson is one that got me in the business um taught me a ton about playing the game and uh, hitting golf shots and tournament play um, and then as we move forward um, throughout my career even uh, as young as i feel like it is um, you look at at some of the great players and now with technology being able to have access to these these coaches and teachers um, across the world um, has been really, really good. Uh, many of them, um, we all have, have ears to hear those, which, you know, James Ridyard, John Graham, uh, Bernie Najar, um, many, many more to list. Um, and even back to the, the, the pattern of the sniper versus the shotgun, Scott Fawcett from playing. Sure. Um, and, and even some, some old teachers, I like to look back at the uh, the Jack Grouts and, and who coached big time players when they were younger and how how they selected coaches how you don't hear a lot about that so trying to dig that information up is is a lot of fun definitely what advice would you give sort of taking taking the young coach you know through uh, a blueprint of how they would get better so what advice would you give say a passionate young coach or even like a PGM student or intern that says they want to be a teacher, a full-time teacher and improve their skills, what, what advice would you give them and some, some ideas? Yeah, I would say that shadow and watch, observe as many instructors as you can from all facets of the game um, and even different philosophies. I think the big thing for young ones is Early on, you kind of have the mindset of you believe what you believe. And I would challenge you to step outside that box. Find somebody that you may really disagree with from a philosophy standpoint and go observe them, take a lesson from them, learn about what they do, because that's only going to broaden your spectrum of knowledge and also you know, the ability to learn to maybe when you're doing your philosophy, which we'll talk about, that it will evolve. Um, some things that I really were against or didn't believe, now I actually adopt a lot of it um, and, and find that there are great ways, even though it may early on go against philosophies that you have, um, there are great ways to be successful. The second thing is, is sit down and write a philosophy of teaching. Take the time to look at that every three months or six months and go, okay, this is where I was. Do I still believe that? And if so, has anything changed? Or what have I, what have I learned currently that would make that philosophy broader? Um, and it is neat to see mine over the span of 23 years evolve. You know, I have it in the same book and I have it dated. So I can see kind of the spectrum of what, what I've done what I used to believe. And then I also go back and write, why don't I believe that anymore? Or how is that better now than when it used to be? And I would say that, you know, learning technology is fantastic um, and it's a great way to gain additional information. 
but many times I use a lot of that for my knowledge and I don't share a lot of it statistically with the player, but it can confirm a lot of things. It can make problem solving a ton faster. And um, so, you know, the technology aspect has really changed in my philosophy, even though I may have it just running in the background and look at it. Yeah, definitely. I have a big problem if I come across a teacher that says they teach the same thing now than they did 10, 15 years ago, because I know I'm I'm exactly in the place you are, is my teaching has evolved so much and things that, you know, I do presentations, I always bring that up. It's like, here's what I thought 10, 15 years ago, and this is what I think now, just because the information is becoming current and it's available to everybody. You know, obviously there's, there's no excuse for being stupid. Yeah. nowadays okay for young coaches out there it's on the internet it's on youtube you know pick up the phone and call reach out to you know dm a coach you know find a mentor like you said shadow ask ask teachers there's very few teachers i think that would say no I mean, there are a few maybe but um most of and I, I i always take huge it's a huge honor it's a privilege if somebody comes to watch you teach and i yeah, think no you doubt. Know, that's it that's fantastic so let's dig into that a little bit. So your ph- let's talk about your philosophy now and then give us some examples of how that's changed from what you used to teach. So my philosophy now would be um, that the player's ever-evolving and that there are a lot of ways to do different things. Some are more efficiently than others. And as a player is in front of me, depending on what their goals are short term and long term um, solutions to those problems. <clears throat> Many of those issues or those problems start with a misunderstanding, really, of why their ball does what it does in the air, uh, what they do to influence the golf club to create that outcome, um, whether it be their body. Um, or the type of golf club that they're playing. I mean, there's so many factors in there. And as a player um, chooses different choices, I would say that, you know, players come to me often and say, you know, I got so many bad habits. And I would challenge that because I don't think that they have a lot of bad habits. I think they've practiced or hit balls or exercised on the range and they've problem solved to find a solution to their problem, the ball not finishing where they want it to and they've created a solution. Now it's not consistent and it doesn't create reliability under pressure, but they've solved a problem. And I feel like it's my job as an instructor that there's not one perfect golf swing out there. There are a lot of great positions. Every player does it differently. We can see that across the spectrum of juniors to amateurs to tour players. And how can they be most effective and be the best version of their self, the most consistent version of their self that they can be, um, not only while they're ball striking in front of me, but how to practice? You know, what should they be doing to get better versus just hitting golf balls on the range? So it sounds like the beginning process of a, of a lesson with you is definitely a lot of interviewing. Would that be fair? I would agree. Right, yeah. which I think is super important. So, so take us through a lesson. So you give us the, the coaches out there listening, what are some of the questions that you ask? And then what are you looking for in a golf lesson and, and sort of getting gathering feedback, obviously, like you're, you're describing. Let's get a little bit more in the details. It sounds like you go interview, sort of analysis, maybe the, you know, the change in the, in, the, in the training, and then you teach them how to practice. Right, and I'm coaching at that point. Exactly. So take um, us from the beginning of a lesson with you. I, I think the, the start of the lesson, I am asking a lot of questions. Um, I'm watching what they do. Uh, I'm watching the ball flight first, um, and then I'm taking away the ball flight, and then I'm seeing, you know, is the club doing what I think it's doing to make the ball do that. And then I take away the club and see if the body doing what it should be doing to find that disease. You're not just treating the symptoms. And so as I'm asking questions, I'm asking very specific questions. Um, so give us an exa- a couple of examples. So what their intention is, what are they trying to do? Um, what have, are they working on anything particular in their golf swing? 
um, do they take video of their golf swing? And if they do, let's pull it up and see. And I'll look not just at one video, front or down the line, I'll look at multiple videos. And what I'm looking for is their camera angle. And I'll ask them, what were you working on in this one? What were you working on in this one? And they'll say many times the same thing because they took it within a 10 day span and they're working on the same thing, but they overdid it in, in quotations here. Right. And, and the reality of it is, is they haven't. They've had their camera in an improper position both times. So from one angle, it looks like the club head may be outside their hands. And then the next 10 days later, the camera's on a different position and the club head looks inside their hands. So they may be on the right path, but not getting proper feedback from what they're doing. And as we go through that, um, them hitting balls, what their goals are, what they're trying to achieve, um, is it realistic? You know, I want to be honest with all players is you have the dream to do this, but yet you only say you practice this. And I generally, whatever they say, I cut it in half. The commitment. The commitment. <laughs> um, so they have to match up and then what their expectation is. So their practice level or may be totally different than what their expectations are. So two things have to change or one or the other. Either they have to change their commitment and practice and quality and quantity of practice or lower their expectations. Because balancing that interesting aspect on the golf course, you may practice for an hour on your putting and, and go play, and you've just been working on hitting a putt from 25 feet next to the hole and walking up and putting it in, having five and six footers, and they go play and think I should putt better because I practice. And the reality of it is they're not, especially if they're counting the number of putts that they're having in a round which is a totally unrealistic expectation because it doesn't about really the worst way to, to gauge whether you're a good putter or not. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and what I relate to them is that, okay, if we're going to calculate something in putting, let's calculate after your first putt, how many inches or how many feet do you have left to the hole and write that down on number one. And number two, you continue to do the same thing at the end of your round, total it up and see how many inches you have left. Your goal next week is to beat that number or the next time you play. And how you do that is you do specific speed control training on sure. the putting green um, throughout your, your week of practice. So, so talk to us a little bit about your full swing philosophy. What do you, what do you believe in the swing? What are some of your, I mean, I, would, I don't want to say fundamentals, but just give us a blueprint of what Chris George believes in. Yeah, I, I would start with, you know, I'm always looking at how the player holds the golf club. Um, and within that, not only how they move in their takeaway and then come through in their impact positions, but what their wrist and forearms are doing during that motion. So I'm paying particular attention to that. I'm looking at stability in their lower body, whether they need to be more centered in their pivot or more rightward or leftward, depending on the handiness of the player. Um, I'm looking at their low point control um, and their ability to do that effectively with face stabilization through impact. Um, as, as a player hits shots, it's also important from an instructor standpoint to throw out the outliers. They're going to hit shots that are offline, and, and most of the time when they hit one of those, that spawns their question, what did I do there? Right. And usually my response is, well, we don't want to hit that shot twice, so we don't need to talk about that one. Let's stay focused on our task that we're trying to achieve through drills and strategies. Um, and depending on the player, you know, I wouldn't stick myself to one specific position, whether it's a club face angle in the backswing or a club face position in the, in the downswing, um, because I've seen players have phenomenal ball striking from a variety of positions that they can do consistently. So <clears throat> you have to know matchups then, right? Like you, you're, you have to know what pieces need to be put in each place to make that functional. I would you absolutely agree with, agree with that, yeah. yeah. And a lot of times early on, <clears throat> especially for the younger instructors, you will, like I'll let my interns or some of my younger chase the rabbit down the hall just to see where it goes, and but of course be there to help them work through it. And I think that's where you learn the most is when you're, you're wow. ex accepting the ability of the player and you learn so much to do that. Um, as you're achieving good ball striking with a player you learn not to make that mistake again or if you do 
um, you can solve the problem a lot faster. And I think that's also where technology has come in by problem solving. What pieces of technology are you using currently? TrackMan, uh, I use quite often. I'll have it running in the background. Um, and then I use um, a blast motion for a lot of short game and, and putting as well. Um, you know, tracking that data, I also use that quite a bit for players' practice sessions. If I'm working with another player and they want to work on their wedge play, it's really important to set up a skills game and then track that and score it and see what they did and go back and look at it and say, okay, today we have to achieve this and see what they did and how they performed. What are some of those games? What are some of your favorite things that you like to use with TrackMan? Do you like to use the combine or do you like build uh, skills tests for your students? I do. I use the combine a lot. I use a lot of uh, skills tests that I've built over time. I'll use um, a game called Leapfrog. So let's say from a player uh, with their wedges, they have to hit shots between 20 and 70 yards. And they have to hit shots. The first shot has to go more than 20. And then they have to complete that game incrementally, continuing out to 70 yards. And as soon as they hit it lower than the last shot they hit, or they hit it beyond 70 yards, they lose the game. So my goal is how many shots can they fit in that window? And then we average out what their average carry distance is, and whether it's 3 yards or 8 yards or 12 yards, mm -hmm. you know, the goal is to beat that next time. Yeah, that's really good. I mean, I think so many, I think, outside looking in players or I think students think that just because we use TrackMan that it's really technical but it's more about just measuring even just yardages right oh, no you know doubt. feel versus yard so it just exposes and helps that player to increase their awareness I think of how far they actually carry the golf ball without a doubt and and that's so important for performance in tournaments because you know, you got to cover yardage to the front, and then you might have a flag yardage, and then you got back of the green or whatever you have. Right. And and so many unskilled players are specifically shooting the yardage to the flag, and they don't know how far they carry the ball. And what I would challenge them to do is is early on when you're learning your distances, is shoot the front of the green, shoot the back of the green, disregard the flag, and then pick a golf club that you can hit to land it between those two yardages. And nine times out of 10, they'll hit the green and they're not aiming at flags. So then they have more putt opportunities for birdie or for par. And then as they do that, they start to be a little more specific and can start to gauge elevation changes. They can start to be better at gauging wind and those kinds of things as they're hitting golf shots in tournament play. But if you're in tournaments and you're confident knowing your carry yardage, you have a huge opportunity um, in order to create more scoring opportunities. Yeah, I think that's, that's that's great advice. I mean, I know we've heard kind of old school guys say, just take the flags out one day yeah. when your members go out, and I guarantee you their scores would go down. Big believer in that. I think, you know, it's the decade system, as we've talked about, is right. it, I think it, it can really be valuable for uh, even higher handicappers uh, for sure, not just good players. So let's switch gears a little bit here and I'm going to ask you a couple of questions what is because I always say that you know we we're viewed from the younger coaches a lot of times hey these guys are successful you know what are those what have they done in their career but it hasn't been all just you know going up right so is there a failure in your career that has led you to later success and do you have like a favorite story I know I've got plenty. <laughs> yeah, there are. Um, I would say everything's great when, you're, when your members and your players are playing well. Um, and then you run into the buzzsaw of a, a player that you're just really struggling with. You, you can't seem to solve the problem. So not all your lessons are perfect? No, <laughs> not by any <laughs> means. Uh, not by any means. And, and when you do that, that really just motivates me to dig deeper. Um, I, I would tell you this, for every hour that I spend with a player, I spend at least two to three hours on their game, whether that be looking at stats, whether that's looking at their video, whether that's looking at their track man data, um, because I truly am invested in this player getting better. I want them to shoot lower scores. I want them to make, play more rounds of golf um, at the club. and. You know, we, we all have successes. 
um, and we kind of shy away from the things that we were not successful in as an instructor and we just look at the peaks versus the valleys but i would tell you that i learned far more from the valleys yeah 100 uh, w- without a doubt um, specifics on on uh, detail of of unsuccessful opportunities i would say that it's the player that challenges me um, that they're they want to play better and i know they have the ability to play better to ball strike it better um, and uh, that player is believe it or not one of my favorites to teach because i i go to a whole nother level um, and what I would say back to the observation of the younger coaches going to watch uh, instructors coach and teach, I would tell you, and I know this from experience because I've had lots of people come and observe me, I take it to another level. Not because I want to show you how well I can teach. I, I'm going to do what I do every day, but I'm much more mindful of how I'm doing it, my mannerisms, um, how I'm communicating. And then afterwards, we sit down and we talk about each lesson and you can fire away all the questions that you want to fire away why did you go this first why did you do face instead of path Um, why weren't you concerned with um, x versus z those are the things that are so much fun and 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 know that some lessons are better than others some lessons are really really easy Uh, the player just gets it really quick and then you have players that are a little more challenging it takes more time to solve the problem um, mainly, I would tell you, because they're doing such different things from swing to swing. That's the challenge. Sure. Um, they don't make a fairly consistent motion every time. You get such a wide spectrum of movement. And it could go from three swings to six swings to nine swings. And so all of a sudden now you're going, okay, well, what am I going to attack? Because I'm seeing lots of different things. Yeah, I think I love when other – teachers come to watch me teach because I, I mean whether we like it or not we teach harder mm. that's what you're that's what you're describing i would agree yeah you're you're more acute to like okay i'm really gonna and not that you don't want to give everybody your 100 percent, but it's easy to kind of as much as we teach it's easy to, to take a take a couple plays off yeah and somebody's watching you and, and you're they're relying on you know learning from you i think it definitely makes you teach harder as, as how uh, it's the only way i can describe it right so that's that's really really good all right, so I'm going to ask you some random questions here, but here's one that that that's always um, it's always good is I always say when when you're developing as a top teacher, I think you you can separate the knowledge that we have into the EQ and the IQ, right? And I think what I try to get across to my staff and in a lot of the younger coaches is how important that self-awareness and the empathy and learning sort of the bedside manners I would call the EQ and obviously the IQ we've talked about how do you learn the how do you learn both and then how do you develop it I mean I think that's any any cues that you that have helped you along the way in, the, in each camp yeah no, no doubt and especially in the EQ um, I would say that surround yourself with not only great golf instructors but surround yourself with people outside of the industry successful businessmen um, uh, psychologists um, people oral communicate communicators um, you know TED talks you know all these kinds of things um toastmasters podcast podcast (laughs) um all these kinds of things and i would say that did you do toastmasters yeah i did too so yeah that's that's so cool yeah when i was like got into full-time teaching and i was absolutely terrified of speaking in front of a group i just like jumped in you do you learn so much about talking um about communicating um, and, and, you know, I'll give uh, Brett McCabe a good plug here. You there know, you his go. book, Mindside. Good friend of ours, yes. That is a phenomenal book. Anybody out there should, should buy that book. It's, it's fantastic. And he talks about surrounding yourself with five influential people um, and using those to your advantage to develop your belief, yourself as a person. Um, and not only with that teaching philosophy, but that belief cycle. Um, as you 
grow as an instructor, those people may change. They may come in and out. You may find that your direction may go a little different. Your interest as an instructor or coach may go a little different direction, even though you're still teaching and coaching golf. And I would tell you that, you know, for me, as an instructor, I love teaching the game and ball striking. Um, I love going to watch players play the game of golf because I learn so much about what they do and how they react. And, and what I've found is that, you know, the difference in ball striking on the range and playing golf on the golf course is a couple of things. One is time between shots. And the other, the, the bigger one is the environment and the stimulation that a player gets from the environment. And that stimulation starts to create a lot of different things that go on emotionally while we're talking about emotions. Yes. And that emotional uh, situation that's developed from the circumstances of the environment start to then create thought. And that thought as a player has to deal with success in your belief of you yourself as your past experiences and you're starting to negotiate believe it or not when you're in that thought pattern so you go from the environment dictating some thoughts to those thoughts starting to create um, emotions and and now we start a whole new dynamic when those thoughts start creating emotions and now you're starting to pull stuff from the past and you start thinking about the future now we got a whole different dynamic and the most important part of that is what happens to the response. What is your response to those emotions? How do those thoughts create those um, criteria and how are you filtering them? And believe it or not, you know, the round of golf may last four and a half, five hours, but these things are happening in really fast yes. 20 to 30 second windows. And if you miss them, you're going to be a train wreck. And, and so being able to myself grow and surround myself with these people and learn more about cognitive development. Uh, Trillium Rose is another one. Mm -hmm. um, and giving the ability for a player to not only have great ball striking, but I've seen great ball strikers shoot big numbers. And I've seen so-so mm, ball strikers shoot really dumb numbers. And mm -hmm. my quest is to find out why. Yeah. What's the difference? What are they managing? How are they controlling those things on the golf course? Yeah, emotional control is, is so important. And I, I know my personal development background involves uh, it's something I talked to Scott Fawcett about when he was on the podcast is Tony Robbins, Brian Tracy, Jim Rohn, Zig Ziglar. Sounds like you have some of that background a little bit in the that. way you the way you talk. Has there been some uh, mentors or sort of uh, learning in that space like just personal development as in your life that you can apply to teaching that you've had yeah i, I would say one is is really close it's my brother-in-law he's ned hallowell and uh, psychologist and and so being able to have him quickly on the phone you know late in the evening and or even just you know talk to him on holidays and have great conversations about you know sports and and how players adapt to different situations um, has been a, a great thing. Um, believe it or not, many of you have a great pool of talent at your own club. Get to know your members. Right. Spend time with them. They do more than what their job title says, I promise you. You could have a COO over your company. They're managing multiple facets of that operation that are very dynamic. And that's a huge piece of the puzzle for you to take part in. Oh, I love that advice. I mean, that's something that, I mean, I probably go overboard sometimes with some of my, my norm, my, my regulars that, you know, they're successful in their business and I'm always asking them questions about, you know, how they got to where they are. And, and half of that tends to apply to their golf game. Right. And a lot of times they're not using that. Yeah. They're, they're thinking it's something different when, you know their their learning style is going against the the way they're they're trying to play golf. So it's but it's always uh, it's always a learning experience for me, especially with the you know the CEOs like you said and the big time. That we have a big banking, obviously in Charlotte. So it's like I get to meet so many successful people, and it's yeah. so interesting. To that's a great point for for young coach, and that's the EQ stuff, man. It's like asking open ended questions to get a response that's going to allow you to teach them better. Yeah. 
you have any stories about any of your, any of your, your lessons that you can think of or any, any, any big time, uh, you don't have to drop a name, but I mean, anything that you've kind of learned from somebody like that, you, I know putting you on the spot. Yeah. You know, there, there are a couple, um, one I would tell you is, uh, uh, played professional football and, and we were talking about, you know, specific things on, on the golf swing and he started to describe, um, the rotation on a football and, and how he created that optimally that it, it rotated X amount of times in the distance from, um, you know, the person that hikes the ball to the wow. guy that catches it. That's analytical. <laughs> and, and, you know, he was wanted to know a lot about what was going on in, in wedge play. And, and that's where I realized, okay, here, here's a phenomenal opportunity because he needs to know that information because it helps him perform better. And, and I would tell you that not all information helps a player perform better, but how it's communicated, how it's related to what they do or have done in the past can make a huge difference. Um, analogies or uh, specific visuals that they need uh, to, to make that light bulb go off. And, and that's one of my favorite things is having the light bulb go off because then it's fantastic. You can see it on their face, right? Yeah. Or you get the, you get the wow, or you get the, the reaction that you're, that's, I think probably the, the, the most answers that we get, why, why do we teach? Yeah. <laughs> is for those moments that you've affected somebody's life. Oh yeah. You've um, changed it big time. Yeah. Cause I mean, it's, it, golf becomes so important to a lot of people and you, we got to remind them that's just a game, <laughs> yeah. right? To the amateurs. It's really, really good. If you were, if you were writing a book, or teaching a class to young coaches, what were the, what would the subjects be, and what do they need to know? Give me the glossary. Oh, um, one, don't think you know everything, because that's about the time you start um, not knowing everything. Have being um, an empty cup. Yeah, being <laughs> I mean, an empty cup. Um, and be open-minded. Uh, that is huge. Um, when you're learning or observing, be open-minded. Uh, when you're taking on um, such a dynamic sport from a movement standpoint and then a strategy standpoint, there, there are so many parts of the game that need to be uncovered. And every day it's being done through research and technology and from 3D to 4D to you name it, it's out there. And, uh, you know, don't shy away from that. But I would also say that don't always – stay so current and modern give some time and some thought to go back in the history of the game and study different players that have had success whether it's Seve in short game or Sarazen or Sneed and, and learn why there's different viewpoints and opinions out there um, that are all in some respect valid in many many yes. parts of the game um, the second thing I would say is that um, develop uh, a process for you to get better every day that you're better today than you were yesterday and you're going to be better tomorrow than you were today and and that's again surrounding yourself with a lot of great people um, within the game and outside of the game um, so that you're ever evolving don't become stagnant don't think that you know it all because we don't i certainly don't and that's why i'm always learning and hanging out with the guru here on the weekends <laughs> um, and, and play as much as you can. Uh, play with the members. You know, I, I'm amazed that I learned so much about their games and what they really want um, and what their expectations are when we're out playing. Um, and, and take time to work on your game. I think that's one of the most fun things. I need to do a things. better job of that. I think sure. we all do. I mean, we stand on the tee <laughs> yeah. 10, 11, 12 hours a day, um, and it's fantastic, and, and we love what we do. But at the end of the day, it's also important to um, – I, I tell you one of my favorite things to do is flip through old golf magazines from even in the 70s or even now and just pop open a tip and, and go and, and work on that and try it and see, you know, how it does. You know, is this something that I could actually make an impact on another player mm -hmm. um, while I'm doing those kinds of things? And, and there's where you start to really validate – your philosophy do I believe this do I believe that do I like this end of the spectrum or do I like this camp over here 
Um, and, and I would say spend time going back and forth. Enjoy that journey um, because it never ends. And, and I love the pursuit of, of better. I like the fact that you write stuff down. That's me. I'm a journal freak. Like yeah. I got journals upon journals, not just the golf, but it's not, it's cool to go back and look at old journals and think, you know, what, what was I working on at this point or in my life or my golf or my teaching? And sometimes it, you get some recollections of, of old ideas that you forgot about. Right. So writing, writing it down, put it in your phone. I mean, I know that the new, the new school now is, is using your phone or I use, I use a couple of different apps that I have notes in, but I think there's nothing like actually sitting down and writing on paper. There's not. I, I certainly believe you retain it a lot more. Yes. There's, um, there's, it becomes there's something, real. There's something that happens in the brain. I've that. heard some research on it when you actually write it down, and that's actually the way I had to get through school um, was to actually write it down and learn it twice and have some uh, – to remember anything. <laughs> a lot of times I had to write it down. So I love that about you. I think – yeah, as continuous learners, as we're as we're discussing, it's important to always stay in that beginner's mindset, that having be in that empty cup. When was the last time you learned a new skill? Oh, last week. Tell me about yeah. that. Um, so, you know, working on, um, you know, I, I like to. I won't say that I play guitar, but I attempt to play guitar. Um, and learning a new skill doesn't always have to entail golf. I think you need to experience what another player is doing in front of you from a physical standpoint, from a mental standpoint, how they're processing information. Um, and I was trying to uh, translate some, some music from uh, guitar to piano and, and make the change and, and learn some very difficult um, key uh, work, let's call it. And um, it, it's frustrating, and I found myself starting to... Learning say, is frustration? Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, yes, it is. There you go. There's golf. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so I, and I had to step back, and I, I said, okay, now let's go back to the basics. When I started to learn, I learned one bar at a time, and then I learned the top line when I could play it precisely at speed, and then I would go to the next one, and I thought, you know... Here's a reality check, pro. Here it is. Uh, you were going way too fast in three of those lessons today, and and you're you're given so much information that you know they just didn't get it. You need to stick to being in the bar. Yeah. And I was like, wow, that was totally non golf related, but it related so much to what I do each and every day. That's that's so good. I mean, I think that's so. That's so. <laughs> It's so similar to what we do every day, and we gotta we've gotta always sort of be on the uh, on the pulse of our students' learning yeah. by asking the questions and watching the the body language. And just because they hit one good shot doesn't mean they have it, oh, right? No doubt. So I think that that's awesome. That's been a very common answer. It's been a lot of my guests of learning get learning a musical instrument, uh, which is is really cool. Yeah, and and as an instructor, uh, learning when to introduce information or new information that you think they may or may not be ready for is, is huge. And that comes from experience. It does. There's no doubt. A lot of trial and error in what we're doing, regardless of what we think. Yeah. Um, but trying to, I think my advice is that, you know, recognize those failures and mistakes and then try not to make them again. Absolutely. And that's the, that's the, the difficult part, but that's how yeah. we learn, right? You, you got to gain information from, from bad shots, you have to gain information from mistakes. And what did you learn from that? And that's a big piece of my journal is I write down every day, not only the lessons I had, but what we did, but what did I learn today? And what did I, di what did I need to know that I didn't know? And then that's what challenged me to get better for tomorrow. And you go find it. And I go find yeah. it. And, and so it's ever evolving. And, and writing that journal down, it's really neat to see, okay, I learned this, and I didn't know this, but I learned this, and I used this today that I did a month and a half ago. And, and it just it makes you a better instructor. It makes you a better coach. Uh, it makes you a better person, especially when you surround yourself with that team uh, aspect um, of influencers. What book or books have you recommended the most or have influenced your career your, or your life? Um, you know, from a golf standpoint, I would certainly say, um, 
from a golf swing standpoint, there there are hundreds of different books, um, all the way from you know golfing uh, machine to five fundamentals of golf to um, elements of the golf swing. So that's spanning a very large yeah, spectrum. Yeah, it's a big. Yeah, it's broad. Um, and then I would say that from a um, player development standpoint um, and personal development standpoint, mind side. Uh, is a big Dr. one. McCabe. Dr. Another McCabe. Another shout out. Um, very, very good book. Yeah. Uh, and, and Champ versus Jump, his new one is, is excellent yeah, as well. Yeah. The, um, and the then I would book. say um, EQ is a great book. Um, any of those that challenge you as an individual, um, that's what I like um, because I want to be a better person. I want to be a better coach um, each and every day. And, and there's so many out there that I would say 50-50, I read as many golf instruction books as I do other pieces of the puzzle, whether that be mental, physical, anatomical, um, for, from a coaching standpoint yeah. and, and personal standpoint. Fabulous advice. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember when I was at Dana's and coaches would come and watch us teach and, and she would, they would always comment on like how many books that I've read because I was just in I still am a big reader and need to get back to doing that more but she goes ask him how many books he's read outside of the, of golf you know and the management and marketing and business and whatever you know like I said personal development I mean there's so many out there that can really uh, help you on the lesson tee you know it's not, and obviously in your life I think if you're <laughs> If you're doing better in your life, you're going to do better in the lessons. You're going to share better. You're going to be a better student, and you're going to be a better teacher. No doubt. There's there's no doubt about that. When you feel overwhelmed or unfocused, what do you do? <laughs> you know, that could happen, uh, you know, during a lesson. It could happen during the day um, because there's so many things that come up in addition to our schedule. Um, you know, the the – attention for our time is is huge um, and being able to manage that um, and I would say the first thing is um, there's there's a great app out there called focus keepers um, mm. and I haven't it kinda, heard that one. it kind of times um, what you do for different segments and and I stumbled upon it too because we have such a limited window uh, to do certain tasks you know, outside of our coaching and teaching. So we get back in the office and we have, you know, 25 minutes, you know, how do we maximize that time without being distracted? And and it's a great way to not only manage what you do in a very condensed, and you'll be amazed just doing this a little bit, how much you can get done when you set a timer for 20 minutes and you keep track of what you're doing. In addition to that, I use it for a lot of players in their practice. So let's say that they're going to do, Um, 30 minutes of putting and they're going to spend 10 minutes on speed control 10 minutes on direction control and 10 minutes on green reading I would have them split the five minutes on speed control with two separate drills Mm -hmm. and they do those two drills for five minutes each and then they move on now they They, they log it into this app it says how does this app work you could um, but I don't have them do that I just have them split the time but but I like to, to split each segment into separate five minute time frames so they might do five minutes on direction control, starting the ball on a ruler, let's say. And then they do five minutes on speed control, putting long and short of a, a line, no hole involved. And then they come back to five minutes of green reading, just walking around the green with a level trying to nail down feel versus real. Mm-hmm. And then they come back to five minutes of direction control, going through a, a hoop. And from that point, um, skipping each one five minute segments and by that time 30 minutes is done in no time at all and they've got a lot out of their time and they've right? got a, a ton of practice done and then they finish that up with um, playing a game and since we're specifically talking about putting and I mentioned how many inches are left to the hole after your first putt mm-hmm. is they play a skills assessment they putt to 18 different holes they start from more than 20 feet and their first putt, whatever it ends, finishing from the hole, the edge, to the front of the ball, they measure that, log it down, total that number of inches. So they're accountable. 
I and, like and I want to be accountable as an instructor. I want them to be accountable for their practice because then it works much more efficiently when we're seeing each other often. Um, and they become better players. They can then incorporate a lot of the game training onto the golf course, and they can see the change in performance and practice it makes a difference in their scores. In the last five years, what habit or behavior has improved your life the most? Wow. The last five years, what habit or behavior? I would tell you this. I would tell you that I'm much more intentional. Um, That's I, a conscious thing? Is that oh, something you, no doubt. Yeah. And, and it was really difficult, and it still is difficult, depending on the day or the situation, um, that take time as an instructor and as a person to make sure that the person in front of you knows that they're the person in front of you. There, there's so many things out there today, phones, um, eye watches, y- you name it, that pull our attention away from what we're actually doing, and that is developing relationships with not only friends and colleagues, but also players. Um, and it's so huge to take the time to learn to be more intentional. And and we say we are, and I say I am each day, and then I realize halfway through the day that I totally whiffed on one conversation because I was distracted. Sure. And, and how you manage those distractions, I would tell you, are, from my experience, are, are triggers and being able to have triggers to know when you're distracted, when you're not intentional, when you're not focused on what's in front of you. And, and use some diversion to help get you back on track. Um, and, and there are a lot of different ones in, in many different um, disciplines, I would tell you. But uh, being more intentional, without a doubt. Do you ever dabble in meditation or anything like that? I do that a little bit of yoga. Or, but, okay, uh, there you go. You know, that, that's a form of meditation. A form. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and even just sitting down and, and trying not to have any conscious thought. Just focus on your breathing, I think, would help so many people because you know th- those little uh, voices or volume in your head that that constantly are trying to distract us or or make something better than it was a minute ago um, is so influential um, and, and I would tell you that th- those are two great ways to do it even just take time even if it's you know 10 minutes and 10 minutes doing that feels like you know, two hours. It feels like, cause you'll get, you know, 15 seconds and a thought will pop in your head and you got to yes. suppress it. If you had to get one message to the world via a billboard, what would it be and why? It could be a quote. It could be hmm. uh, some kind of mantra, anything that you would want to share with the world. Wow. That's deep, bro. Um, they're, they're a lot. Um, I, I would tell you, be the best version of you you can be. Be intentional um, and take time um, to never stop learning. Uh, those would be some of the highlights um, for, for all aspects, not only of coaching, but just in general of life. It's a good, that, that's solid. I would, I would expect nothing less from you, my man. <laughs> so thanks so much for, for coming on. And, and this has been fantastic. And I'm, I'm, I know I get to spend a couple more days with you, which is really exciting. But I appreciate you sharing with the, with the listeners. And tell the, tell the guys or the, the, the listeners out there how they can get a hold of you. Give them their social media handles. I know you're on Twitter. Sure, yeah. You're on Instagram. You're doing doing the deal and uh, yeah. how they can say thank you yeah absolutely um chris at chris george golf is my twitter and instagram um and it's been an absolute pleasure to spend a couple of days with you and hang out and uh talk shop and then talk life absolutely uh, it's absolutely wonderful i appreciate it yeah thanks so much for coming on i really appreciate it you're welcome welcome back everyone guru here again with a couple of things before you go Uh, First, big thank you to my friend Chris George for coming on the show and taking the time. Uh, It was such a cool week uh, hanging out out with him in Williamsburg, uh, talking shop and and eating some good food and drinking some some good craft beer as well. So we had just a blast uh, getting to catch up because I don't get to see him as often as as I want. So big thank you to him. 
uh, for all the great information on teaching, coaching, and some valuable life lessons in there and personal development. Uh, don't be afraid to reach out to Chris on the Twitter. Uh, you can reach him at Chris George Golf or on Instagram as well. Or check out the website uh, www.kingsmill.com and say thank you uh, for his valuable information. Also, tweet me your biggest takeaways from uh, this interview with Chris as you can reach me on Twitter or Instagram at Golf Guru TV. And also check out my website, golfgurutv.net, where you can find videos, articles, and a lot of information on my teaching and coaching. Also, send in your questions for Guru Friday uh, by emailing the show at golfgurushow at gmail.com. That is golfgurushow at gmail.com where I will use a fake name or assign you one or you can make one up yourself and I will answer all your teaching and coaching questions, uh, which will be a lot of fun. Thanks once again for, for all the responses, uh, the subscri subscriptions and the downloads just keep coming and I'm overwhelmed with the response of the show. So I really appreciate it. Reach out to me though. Let me know how you're doing. Uh, let me know uh, what I can do better. Uh, hit me up on the DM if you don't want to uh, publicly uh, tweet me or send me an Instagram message. But once again, I, I really appreciate all the well wishes, responses, and the positive feedback that I'm getting uh, from all you coaches out there. So as I always talk about at the end of our shows, study, practice, teach, and then pass it on. I'll talk to you next time. And thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.